Hey guys, welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be looking at the mighty Avro Anson by Airfix. This is a relatively new release, so let's see how it gets on. I hope you enjoy, let's get into it. So, for those of you unfamiliar with the Anson, there is an awful lot of glass in this kit. Therefore, Airfix made sure to include a very, very detailed interior. The only slight problem that there is with being so much detail is the fact that there are now so many sub-assemblies. This cockpit was, um, or interior I should say, had like, oh, I couldn't even tell you how many different components. The only bright side to this is they all almost fell together and Airfix absolutely nailed it here. So moving more on to some specifics, here I am assembling some of the seats. There are an awful lot of seats in this kit, however they all go together very nicely indeed and in my opinion they look very convincing as in the uh, the cushion part looks very plump <laughs> i don't know if that's the right word but we'll go with plump and then as you saw in the video these fell in some very nicely sized locator pins making sure that they would slot into place i then went on to making some of the framework for the seat's legs these went together really nicely as well and once again slotted in some nicely placed locator pins uh, what I can say from the, the interior of this kit is it's very, very well engineered. However, that does not continue throughout the kit, as you will see. So, moving on, I completed a couple more sub-assemblies of chairs before moving on to putting one of two wing spars in. You already saw me put in one of the little wing spars, however, that was the second one. These slot together onto some really nicely um, placed sort of walls, I guess. Uh, or lips in the plastic so there's no going wrong here on where to put them so here's one bit of the build which i really really enjoyed it was making these uh lamps and stuff for the navigator i assume uh his desk it was just really really fun um building all of these sorts of little elements that bring the interior to life on this kit and i think airfix have done a superb job of modeling all of these aspects one of these aspects is the transponder slash radios which you've seen me building. This is a really really nice uh, little bit of engineering, it just slots together almost like a little bit of origami, it's brilliant. You also have to be really careful with this kit, make sure you pay attention to the instructions are, as there are sorry, a couple of holes that need to be drilled out. Uh, one of these, or two of these as you saw, is in one of the side panels of the interior, there's also one on one of the engine nacelles. So, keep an eye out and if you don't already get one of those micro uh, drill bit sets you'll see I use it later on in the video as well they are such a diverse piece of equipment so on the whole I'd say Airfix did very well with uh, making sure that their ejector pin marks weren't seen or were in good uh, places however this one I was just being extra cautious so I made sure to fill it with some super glue and then sand it all back it was then time for our first bit painting the interior was of course done with interior green as a base. Sometimes I like to do a black base beforehand and then spray because you can uh, bring out a couple of shadows. However, in this build I wanted to try some new techniques with oils and also some slight tonal variation with different shades of green. So I've definitely had a couple of people ask me what cockpit green colour I use and I think I've said it before, however I'll say it again. I use Tamiya's cockpit green, I think it is the most accurate representation of the cockpit green, however that is a debate, you know, all uh, colours when it comes to modelling are usually debated, however that is my personal opinion. So I used cockpit green on all of the interior aspects um, and then I used, as you can see in the video, a slightly lighter green mixed with a bit of buff to just accentuate a couple of highlights and create some tonal variation. Once that was done it was time to pick out some details. Here you can see me picking out the, the yoke, I guess we can call this a yoke, um, and also a couple of the other aspects, uh, like the lamp and also the seats as you'll see in a second. For brush painting I like to use Vallejo model air colours, I know it's a little bit hypocritical using model air uh, for airbrushes as brush painting, however they, they just seem to go down really really nicely and they have nice coverage. and. You know, some paints when you go back over them when you're brush painting, it'll like scrape all the paint off. These these don't these uh, stick and uh, stay down really nicely. So here you can see that I had now painted the seats in the black, and now what I'm doing is I'm getting a grey colour and I'm just kind of putting a bit on and then scraping it off to simulate some scratches and rips in the chairs. 
then to make the chairs look more faded as I thought they looked a little bit too stark as a jet black I put a little uh, dab of white oil paint in there and then blended it in I think this made them look much more faded and much more authentic I then repeated this process on uh, aspects of the floor just to create a little bit of tone of variation. Then I came in on top with a couple of burnt umber and brown colours just to simulate a little bit of dirt and grime, especially where the feet of the crew would have been. To now bring out a couple of surface details, I'm using an oil wash. I'm also utilising this oil wash by uh, placing it and dabbing it in a couple of little areas, but specifically I use it to draw out some of the detail in panel lines as you can see me doing here. So I'll put it in and then leave it to dry for a couple of minutes then get a fresh uh, cotton bud and just kind of remove the excess. Uh, don't want to remove too much as you want the effect to stay uh, but I think this is a really effective and quick way of really livening up a model. So once I was happy with all of the griminess in the cockpit it was time to then do a little bit more detail painting. Here you can see me picking out a couple of details on the back wall with a couple of silvers, leather paints and a variety of other paints, just what the instructions said. I didn't have any reference images unfortunately. It was then time to paint the framing of the transponder slash radio. Uh, this was actually really quite easy to do because of how raised the framework is. Um, and then instead of using the supplied kit decals, I used a dry brushing method. I think this was actually much better and in my opinion a much easier and safer method rather than risking it all on decals and stuff and I think that the outcome is really quite nice. Moving on now to assembling the control panel and throttle column. So the uh, it's, it's quite interesting, quite unique way of putting the rudder pedals on as it's quite a unique design. They hang from above rather than sitting on the floor like some of the uh, other aircraft of that era like the ME109 I believe they have ground or floor sitting rudder pedals but anyway um, so they had a nice little system to get that done two nice locating uh, location pins and the same same with the control column there were a couple of little details which had to go on however easy enough because uh, airfix supplied some nice location pins these two sub assemblies then almost slip together I think slip is the right word but it, it's an easy enough process anyway so then, it was time to put this uh, decal onto the uh, the desk of the navigator, there we go. And I thought, I'm not just going to put a decal there because, you know, no book is that flat. So what I did is I got the decal, I put it onto a, a laying around lolly stick and then cut around it. This was then glued onto the navigator's desk um, with PVA glue and it just gave you know a little bit more interest more of a 3d effect I'm not too sure if that's to scale so <laughs> you know not too sure there but that is what I did and I recommend you doing the same it's very very quick very easy and um, yeah just adds another dimension to your build so on with a little bit more detail painting this time we're back on the transponder had to make sure I did a little bit more than just a dry brushing here as we wanted it to look better than the kit supply decal. Speaking of kit supply decals, this is the one for the control panel. As there was no real uh, surface detail of any of the knobs and gauges, I uh, just made sure to do, use the actual um, decal. This was applied using Microset and Microsol. Uh, I think I used three rounds of it to get that sort of indentation. But you know, they're airfix decals, you know what you're going to get. They will go down with no issue whatsoever. Once the decal was all done and applied, it slipped into place uh, with, once again, really nice uh, location pins. I think the highlight of this kit is just the, the lovely location pins. They, you know, there's no, I don't think I put any piece in the wrong sort of place because of it. So it was then onto one of the trickier elements of the build, as you saw me there uh, putting the, the framework in. It's a really, really cool design and it does slot into place with relative ease, but just be very very careful because these pieces are so thin and I, I got so close to snapping one of them. I think I warped one piece a little bit but then I got the heat gun out and just heated it and bent it back into a straighter position. So that's what I recommend you do if you do encounter the same issue. However there are some really nice um, sort of guide guidelines I guess we can say guidelines or guide marks to where to put the framework so I'm sure you won't run into any issues. 
so what you just saw me wagging my finger at was the fact that my personal kit had a, a warped or misshapen window glass piece which um, I was I was quite disappointed about um, I was going to try and replace it by using some varnish to kind of create a window however that didn't work out in the end so I was left without a window which was a real shame and also this is not the last time that I was defeated by a misshapen part as you'll see in the future. On to a more positive note, this frame, um, framework I guess we'll call it, did go together really really nicely to be fair. Um, I did, I was, I was a little bit worried about it going into the kit thinking oh god like how would, how would you make that in scale, however Airfix nailed it really, you know there was no issues, uh, no fit issues, no real warping issues which I thought could be an issue. God, that's a that's me saying issue a lot, but the general theme is it is is good. It's a good bit of engineering. Moving on from me not saying issue as much, we uh, just were making the back gunner turret sort of cradle, and now you can see me putting in uh, the gun to the interior. I I don't know if there was any other way to do this because this is what it says in the instruction, and it was just super duper fiddly, you know, like super super fiddly. Uh, took me many many attempts but you know we, we got there in the end and you can do it just make sure your tweezer skills are on point so once all guns were fitted it was then time to put the gunner framing slash cradle slash thingy uh, into the back and once again nice location pins so there was no real fit issues there so after many many days of working on the interior it was time to close it all up the two fuselage halves go together impressively well impressively well yes of course there were a couple of seams however all sorted with a little bit of super glue as you'll see uh, speaking of glues as per se uh, i use on the whole tamiya extra thin for this kit however in certain areas i did use rebels contactor i'll make sure to point that out to you next time uh, then the roof went on, the roof went on really nicely indeed, but you know there is a little bit of an issue on the far left as you can see, but that will be sorted out with some filler, some sanding and some, you know, sculpting. The underside does then also snap into place. This one also did have an audible snap, which I found quite impressive. That's usually, that's usually only found on Tamiya kits, you know, when the, you actually hear a snap into place like a Lego brick. Very, very cool. The elevators come in two separate pieces, you have a main underside with a spar and then two upper surfaces which have to get plonked on. Then this sub-assembly is put into the general uh, horizontal stabiliser, I guess that's the right word, horizontal stabiliser assembly which then snaps into the back of the main fuselage, very nicely indeed. Once that was all cemented into place, the upper surfaces of the horizontal stabilizers snapped again once on. They, they really, really nice. I did use some clamps here, however. Moving on, we uh, can now see how I have put some super glue over any of the seam lines, which I didn't think were too good. This was then sanded back, as you can see. I mean, this is only one sort of small snippet. However, I did spend several, several hours making sure that you um, couldn't see any seams. You start on a harsher grit, more like at this stage where I've used either three or 400 grit, and then you'll slowly work back up more to 1500, that sort of range, just to polish it off and give a nice finish and prevent any scratches. After my fingers felt like they were about to fall off after the sheer amount of sanding, it was time to get back to doing some more sub-assemblies. Here you can see me doing the gear well, or gear well, I guess gear well is the right word, uh, gear bay, gear well, uh, sub-assembly, goes together quite nicely, a uh, bit fiddly in places, um, also the location pin of that tube that you could see really wasn't too good. But you know just take your time on it and you'll be fine this was all given a coat of cockpit green and then cemented into both sides of the wing this was duplicated one on each side so the landing lights then slotted into the wings as well 
be sure to make sure you do this before you cement the upper wing surface as I'm pretty sure one of my mates was building one of these and he, he completely forgot and then there's just a big void in the wing and it does not look good at all. As you saw from the previous clip, the, the wings go together really nicely, no real seam to sort out at all, which is really nice. However, there are seams to sort out in the engine uh, gear base sort of area. If you want to have a nice seam on top, which is what I opted for, that will result in an utterly gargantuous, and I don't use that word lightly, gargantuous gap underneath which will have to be sorted out with filler and super glue as you can see there I use filler on the left and super glue on the right not fun I know that was only about a 10 second clip however that took years to sort out however after that palaver as you saw in the previous clip I was putting all the masks on for the canopy I also did that for the um, side windows but I didn't record it as I, I, I don't think that would be a huge interest to the viewer however that mask set is from CT models I believe and I can highly recommend fit very well anyway enough of me rambling on about masking and sanding and whatnot here you can see me making up all of the engines the engines go together very nicely some pretty intriguing um, use of location pins to make sure that you get the right orientation of parts but worked very well. Here you can see me putting on some of the very very um, distinctive like knobs or bubbles or whatever technical word you want to call them for the engine nacelles. They, um, they, they went on really nicely, had the right curvature and everything, no filler was needed at all. So after all the details, whether that be through metallics or blacks or everything, once that was all painted up, I did think it still looked a little bit bare, so I once again used the dry brushing technique. If you can't really tell, I love dry brushing. I think it works incredibly well. Then once I was satisfied, this snaps into the first piece of the engine now. So, and then it's almost like a jig. Well, the, the engine acts as a jig for the rest of them. And if you take your time here, you, you will be very happy with the results because there, there's there's a small sort of hairline seam but nothing that you can really sort out because of the the bubbles and bubbles in the engine so you just kind of have to accept it but it's it's not that noticeable at all so this is what i meant when i said your micro drill bit set is a very diverse piece of kit here you can see me adding a level of realism to the exhaust uh, stub uh, just by drilling it out and actually making it hollow as it would be in real life after that was all done that was both of my engines completed these then snap onto the engine um, with a nice sort of location tab um, however make sure you push it the whole way in as I did fall foul on one of them by not pushing it the whole way in because I was a little bit scared that I was going to damage the engine but push it the whole way in because Later on, my prop didn't sit properly, but anyway, it's a small issue. So I was incredibly nervous to put the glass into this kit because I, I, I thought something was going to go wrong, and something did go wrong. My piece was obviously warped, as you can see in this kit. It is warped, you know, you, to get it in the right position, you have to apply pressure. Uh, this was sorted by using clamps, masking tapes, and also tears. <laughs> Not not a fun experience. I don't know if I got a dud kit because quite a few of my pieces just went up to, you know, normal standard. Anyway, whilst I was wiping my tears away from the um, slight glass malfunction, it was time to go on to the gunner pod. Uh, this sub-assembly was actually quite enjoyable to do, but however, as you can see on screen by the text, don't be a mug like me and actually read the instructions. Uh, as you can see here, I'm putting it in the wrong way, so do not emulate me. Instead, put it in like this. You, you'll see in a second in the clip, but like that. There you go. You want it to look like that, not like how it looked before. You'll know one when you've got it right because it will almost fall into place. Uh, once that was done, it was all painted black, and then the sides of the uh, turret glass were all masked off, um, and then they encapsulate the the gun and the the framework really nicely actually it was much 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 more enjoyable than other steps in the build <laughs> and there was the finished turret 
really nice. This then slips into the um, the fuselage uh, very nicely actually. Uh, speaking of fitting very nicely, the landing lights I did have a little little bit of a little bit of a worry about them after having some warped parts, but this piece was fine and it slips into place very nicely. So then it was just a matter of putting a couple of the last pieces on, uh, which didn't have any issues, which was, you know, refreshing. Um, and then there you go. That was the, the finished, well, pretty much finished model ready for painting. So before I did any primer, let me just point out that I did give the exterior or exterior where there was glass a layer of cockpit green, as that is what the framework would be on the inside. Then we primed it and then we mottled it. If you have seen the channel before, you know how much I enjoy mottling. Mottling is pretty much just creating loads and loads of tonal variations in the above colors. To do this, you use your white, you just kind of do loads of squiggles and it will create areas of brighter patches and darker patches. And it also accentuates the panel lines as well. So it's a technique which I always seem to use. I might try some different techniques at some point, however, it's a, it's a stable technique and I like the result. So it was then time to actually get the camouflage done. I personally like to freehand all of my camouflages. It's personal preference. Some people like to spend the time masking and have really, really sharp lines. However, I think I achieve a reasonable effect just by freehand cameraing. I do this by initially doing a draft or a sketch of, the, of where I want the camouflage to go and then I will come back and uh, fill in the rest. I also like to make sure I do quite light coats so that I don't destroy the mottle effect that lies underneath. I also started on the flat earth colour because if I started on the dark green or the RAF dark green colour it was um, going to be much much harder to kind of fill in over the top of that you know I'd need a much uh, larger coat and it would probably destroy all of that mottle effect which I'd achieved underneath uh, so usually um, on the whole in my personal opinion you want to start with a lighter color and then go to a darker color so when it comes to actual paints that I'm using in this kit uh, on this kit sorry I'm using once again Tamiya's uh, flat earth here and RAF dark green here you could see me, I'd finished off all of the um, flat earth colour and I was ready to go on to the dark green. Dark green uses the exact same process as I previously mentioned, however this time it's less sketching and it's more just filling in. That being said, I do like to sometimes outline against the flat earth just to make sure I have an even sharper and more crisp camouflage. So a nice little tip for you is um, if you want to retain your mottled effect and you know just make sure that you don't drown it out with the colour, I'd recommend thinning down your um, darker coloured paints a little bit more than your lighter coloured paints. This will just make sure you have more control and achieve a more uniform finish with the mottled effect because sometimes you'll have models or at least I know I've had model, um, models where the mottle effect is much stronger on the lighter camouflage, uh, lighter aspects of the camouflage rather than the darker colour of the camouflage. So just a little tip for you and that's what I did here. So drifting away from the painting slightly is um, the fact that I, I, I used a filler and it completely contracted overnight and as you'll see it left this, this pretty huge seam unfortunately. Uh, which made me cringe a little bit, however, you know, just, just don't look in that sort of area. Going back to a more positive note, that is what you just saw, that was the, the final camouflage. It was now time to do a little bit of masking and sort out the silver underside. Usually, if you've watched the channel before, you know I like to use MIG's metal colour range. Uh, I think they're brilliant, however, this time I thought I'd try something else. I'm using Tamiya's, oh, what's it called? I think it's called titanium silver I think that's what I'm using on this one um I I quite liked it I don't think I sprayed it down very well I think it was a little bit patchy and I also could have used a, a more glossy black before putting it down however I was I was happy with the result and I, I do think it was you know it, it was quite nice however I think next time I'm doing a metal finish I might go back to my MIG uh, just because um, it's something I'm more comfortable with in a previous clip you might have seen that there was a little bit of paint pulled off 
um, from the demasking process, which was a bit of a shame, but there was the final outcome. After a couple of evenings of painting, it was quite nice to get back to a couple of sub-assemblies. Here you can see me putting together one of the gear legs. The gear go together um, like most gear in any other kit, uh, two halves slapped together and there you go. However, I did, I think maybe when I was uh, taking them off of the sprue, cut in a little bit too much, so there was a little bit of a gap between two of them. This was filled using some Vallejo white putty. The hubs of the wheel were painted silver before being masked off and painted with a rubber colour. I don't really like to use black as much on my uh, wheels just because it doesn't look right. I think this tyre and rubber colour is a little bit more convincing. The wheels then have to be slid into place. Uh, be very careful not to scratch your paintwork here uh, as it, it could be quite easy to do so. We then had to put in another gear leg before we could attach the rest of the gear assembly. This was actually really really sturdy um, and it, it slots together quite nicely. It almost falls into place um, which was quite nice. I also used a different colour of silver here for the underside uh, purely because when looking at a couple of reference images apparently these were these gear legs were replaced sometimes with different metals uh, so I just thought I'd add that as a little bit of detail. Here you can see me putting the tail wheel in. Once again, really nice location pin. So it was now just a matter of putting on some of the final elements, uh, such as here's a component for the engine and the props and also the prop hubs, I guess we can call them, the little bits which go uh, on in front of them. Uh, there you go, here you can see them now. And it was just a, a matter of gloss coating it and getting ready for all of the decals. A nice positive to this kit to finish off on was the uh, lovely location areas for all of the antennas. In some kits, or well no, in most kits, sorry, that there's just there's non non adequate areas or location places or contact points is probably the right word for antennas. However, Airfix nailed it on this bit. So with the gun going on, that was the final bit of construction for this kit. Here you go, that is the final sort of build. It was now time to give it a gloss coat and move on to doing some of the decals. The decals I believe were printed by Cartograph, so they were your usual Cartograph um, sort of quality. I didn't spend too long uh, on the filming on this as there weren't a huge amount of decals to go on and it was a pretty self-explanatory method. I like to use um, Micro Set and Micro Sol, starting with Micro Set the decal on, giving it five minutes and then going on in with the micro sole. Uh, not too much to say about these except for they were a little bit fiddly in places but not, not, nothing, nothing too out of the ordinary here. Another good way to make sure that your decals have good adhesion is to almost massage them into the underlying details with a cotton bud. It's a technique which I've used quite a lot. Um, and it works brilliantly. So the final final step before I show you all of the finished photos was demasking. I didn't do too much recording of this as once again it was pretty boring but the mask didn't leave any residue whatsoever um, so yeah all good and with that the build was finished. So here it is this has been my take on Airfix's brand new Avro Anson uh, in summary, I think I can definitely recommend this kit to an experienced modeler, however if you're relatively new to the hobby I'd say stay away just for a little bit longer. That's just because I personally had a little bit of an issue with a couple of the parts not being formed cro uh, properly and it, it's just a little, bit, a little bit sticky in areas as I hope the video conveyed. On a different note, I'd like to take this uh, time just to say an incredibly, incredibly big thank you from me. Uh, we recently hit 1,000 subscribers on the channel. Uh, I am so taken back by the amount of support uh, that I've been getting recently and I just hope that I can continue to deliver some brilliant modeling content for you. So a big thank you from me, a big thank you for all the support and I hope you are as excited as me to see what the rest of 2023 brings for this channel. Anyway, I hope you've enjoyed and I'll see you next time. Bye bye.